morning, everybody. Man, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, the weather is beautiful. For the record, they're all good days, but this day just happens to be really beautiful. The weather's nice. The, uh, the, the leaves are changing colors. I've started to see some of them hit the ground. It's getting to be a little cooler. They're not all sweating to death anymore. It's been great. And the little cherry on top is that today, I won't be turning my bread as the sign in the back of the, the church. Today, I won't hopefully be too embarrassed. It's going to be great. I have been getting quite red recently. That will not be the case today. If you want to see that, definitely come back next week. Because that will be unavoidable, I promise. Next week, it's just gonna, there's going to be a lot of embarrassment. It's going to get kind of weird. And we're just going to have to deal with it. Uh, but that's just what's going on. So we are continuing our sermon series, Like a Love Song. We've been going through the Song of Songs, or some, some Bibles they call it the Song of Solomon. And we've been looking at different things that we can learn from this book as Christians and taking different principles to apply to uh, relationships, marriages, intimacy, and things that kind of fall under that umbrella. And we've been looking at some of the different things uh, regarding those topics in last, the past couple of weeks, we've kind of dealt with the, the stage right before marriage is mostly what we've really dealt with. We've looked at dating, which was the first week. We looked at kind of that initial attraction, uh, dealing with the, the first few dates and kind of the beginning of a relationship. Last week, we looked at courtship. And we talked about what it's like when you start to step into a relationship where you might see it uh, heading towards marriage eventually. And today, we are going to be talking about marriage. Today, we're talking about marriage. We finally get to uh, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon chapter 3, and we're in the second half of chapter 3 today. And we finally see this wedding ceremony unfold. Now, if you remember, uh, we have looked for the past two weeks with one quick command that the, the woman primarily gives of this story, not to stir up love until the appropriate time. As I mentioned last week, that's the last time that we see it until the very end of the book. And my, my belief regarding the one at the very end is that now that the whole story has unfolded and this whole poem or song has unfolded, it's kind of almost like a, an older, wiser woman's words of wisdom to the younger generations. That's kind of the way that I would interpret it at the end. And so now, as of today, we kind of throw that to the wind. That kind of goes out the window at this point. We don't see it until the very end, but this is what it, it says. This is Song of Songs, chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. And I'm going to kind of go through it real quick, and then we're going to kind of look at it and break things down a little bit. This is what it says. Who is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, scented with myrrh and frankincense from every fragrant powder of the merchant? Look, Solomon's bed surrounded by 60 warriors from the mighty men of Israel. All of them are skilled with swords and trained in warfare. Each has his sword at his side to guard against the terror of the night. King Solomon made a carriage for himself with wood from Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, and its seats of purple. Its interior is inlaid with love by the young women of Jerusalem. Go out, young women of Zion. And gaze at King Solomon, wearing the crown his mother placed on him on the day of his wedding, the day of his heart's rejoicing. Now, to maybe catch some of us up and maybe explain some of the stuff going on, uh, if you've been with us, you know that I don't necessarily think that the relationship going on throughout the book is about King Solomon. Uh, so now... If you've heard me say that, you're super confused because we've just gotten here and it says King Solomon, his bed, his carriage, and all that good stuff. So I'm going to do my best to kind of break that down. So the argument that I've made in the past is that there are different aspects of a song, which we're going to get to, where it sounds like this is more of a critique of King Solomon. 
Right? So if we're tracking along, King Solomon, he has 700 wives and 300 uh, kind of side chicks, which we've already talked about. We've already dealt with that. Uh, this is very clearly a story about one man, one woman, and the love that blossoms, it blooms, and it unfolds in one story. And later on, when we get towards the end of the book, we're going to see this quick little uh, mention of how some men have a thousand gardens, but the man of this story is content with his one garden. So that's kind of a spoiler. That is why I believe that it is not about King Solomon. My view of what's unfolding here is that this is meant to show the royalty and kind of the extravagance that happens in a way, right? I want you to imagine a wedding. Many of you, maybe you've been married. Many of you have probably been to weddings. You've probably seen something about a wedding. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, what tends to unfold is you have these groomsmen, and they're in there. You have the groom, and he's there. You have the bride and the, the bridesmaids, and the groom and the groomsmen, they show up in clothes that they typically can't afford. They go and they rent it, and it's meant to be these really nice clothes, and that's typically how it unfolds for the men. And then you have women who, like, they think they can afford wedding dresses, and then you find out how you're going to finance it, and, like, let's just be real, that's typically what kind of happens as these things unfold. I've watched a lot of, admittedly, I'm not proud of this, but I like some of those like girly drama kind of shows, and so like I've watched some of these shows where like they're picking up their wedding dresses, and I'm like, which one is she going to go with? Admittedly, I've been there, okay? <laughs> Judge me later. <laughs> if you no longer want me to be the preacher here because of that, tell me after church. Um, you don't have to say that right now. But, I watched one and she was like, I want to get two wedding dresses. And I'm sitting there like, two wedding dresses? How are you going to pay for that? That is crazy. So that's what typically unfolds when we have weddings is there's beautiful dresses, nice suits. Everybody shows up looking as nice as possible. Even the people who aren't even like part of the wedding, they're just there to watch. They show up and they're dressed nice. And there's always decorations, whether it's in a church or whether it's outside or at some venue. It's always decorated. You have the cute little flower girl, and she comes down, and she's throwing out rose petals all over the ground. And, like, it's just this beautiful thing that unfolds. My belief is that what's happening is that the wedding between the two people who are in love is being compared to something as extravagant as what you would see with a man who's got wisdom, wealth, women, and a bunch of other things that start with W. Um, that's kind of what I envision is happening here, is that this isn't necessarily Solomon actually showing up. I think it's more of a comparison to what it would have been like for somebody who's a big royal king to have a wedding. That's kind of my view. Now, we haven't really broken things down too much yet, which I know you're like, we haven't? Please bear with me. There's a lot to explain. But here's what I want to quickly do real quick, if you'll bear with me. I just wanted to read some statistics. Uh, as we get into this wedding, as we get into marriage and this topic of marriage and how we as Christians should be handling marriage, I want to go through some statistics briefly. And I hope that these might alarm you, because they probably should. I did a quick little Google search, and I was looking at some, some different statistics about marriage. This is what I found. 20% of men cheat on their spouse, and about 13% of women do. So we have about 7% higher rate of men being unfaithful in an actual marriage. Now, many of you, that might not surprise you. Maybe some of you, you're like, maybe you're surprised that it's not higher. These are just people who are willing to admit that they have. So we're just going to throw that out there. Out of 75 juvenile delinquents, they did a quick study on basically these kids who get sent to a juvenile detention center. 66 
come, uh, 66% came from fatherlessness. So they had no father in the home. 20% never had a father in the home. And 25% had alcoholic fathers. Fatherless children are anywhere from 3 to 20 times more likely to end up incarcerated. About 84% of homeless families have no father in the home. About 90% of homeless and runaway children come from fatherless homes. About 63% of youth suicides happen in fatherless homes. About 85% of children with behavior disorders are from fatherless homes. Approximately 18.3 million children have no father in their home in the United States. Something that is kind of a, a stereotype. Daddy issues, quote unquote daddy issues present in women, believe it or not, that has been rebranded as a syndrome called fatherless daughter syndrome. And if you Google that last term, fatherless daughter syndrome, you can find article after article after article of ways to combat that. There's been a huge push in our nation and in our society to break away from the nuclear family, which nuclear is just a fancy way of saying that there's a mother, a father, and children present in a home. There's been a huge push to break away from that not necessarily because that's just a better way of having it. I would argue that it's because you can't find men who are willing to be good fathers and stick around for their kids. Yeah. There is a huge issue when it comes to marriages and how they are unfolding in our society today. Now, I didn't come up here just to like dog on men and say like men are scum, that's not what this is about, that's not what I'm trying to do. Everybody has problems. If you remember from either last week or the week before, we kind of dealt with how everybody has these foxes. It was last week. Everybody has these foxes that are present in relationships. Uh, the foxes are things that tear away love. And eventually you just have to learn how to deal with these foxes and get rid of them. That's what we talked about a little bit last week. Everybody has it. Everybody has problems that have to be dealt with. But it should be pretty alarming that we have a lot of men in our society not willing to deal with problems. That's kind of what it sounds like. And the reason that I want to bring this up as we start to dive into marriages and seeing a biblical perspective for marriage is because as we read, we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5 next. So if you want, you can go ahead and turn there. We're not going to it yet, but uh, if you want to quickly go there, we, we, you can. The reason that I want to bring it up is because when we approach Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to see what Paul says about how men in marriages ought to be loving their wives. That's what we're going to find. As a quick little preview, just this past week, I was going through TikTok because, again, if you want to hate me because I'm young and, you know, I watch girly shows and I go on TikTok, feel free. But I was on TikTok, and for the most part, you find a lot of funny videos. Every now and then, I come across some videos that are a little bit more serious, and recently, this past week, I came across a video, and it was some kind of video talking about uh, how women often have these really rough situations with their men and how their men have been kind of passive. Essentially how they like to kind of complain while women have a car. And at first, I start to think, oh man, this is just people complaining. Then I access the comments. And I start to scroll through the comments, and I'm just like, look at all these people who want to complain about their problems on the internet. What a bunch of weirdos. But as I read, and as I fought my initial thoughts, I sat there and I read, and it was one story after another. And it was stories like this. 
I was in labor for 12 hours, and the entire time, my husband sat in the chair doing nothing except complain about how uncomfortable the chair was. And, you know, it's, we laugh, and it's easy to laugh, but when you see hundreds of these stories, it starts to get a little concerning. When you start to see stories where uh, their, their wife has just given birth, they're in that recovery phase, and they're going to their wife who has just given birth, and they're like, what's for dinner after getting home that week? You start to think, wait a second. Is there really a whole lot of love here? Are you loving your wife, or are you just hoping to get love from your wife? And as I watched this all unfold, I couldn't help but sit there and be like, man, us as guys, we have to do a much better job. Now, as many of you know, I've been talking about The Mingling of Souls, uh, which is a book written by Matt Chandler. I finally remembered to grab it, so I do have the copy of it here. Uh, this book breaks down the Song of Songs probably better than I can. Like I have mentioned many times, there are certain points where I disagree with Matt Chandler, but I would argue that there's a point he makes that I would highly agree with. He would argue that in the United States and kind of throughout the world as a whole, one of the biggest issues that faces men is passivity. You might think that there's all these other issues that are going on with men today, but for the most part there are. I'm not going to sit here and deny that there are problems that men face. But he would take it all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and he would say, he points you to where Eve takes the apple from the tree, maybe, we'll just say it's a fruit, maybe an apple, who knows. She takes the fruit, she bites the fruit, and it says in the text that her husband Adam, who is standing right next to her, watching all of this unfold, says nothing. Not a single thing. He was given the instruction not to eat the fruit, and as he watches his wife, the person who he is supposed to love unconditionally, eat this fruit, and keep in mind, what Adam believes about this fruit is that if she eats it, she will surely die that day, and he watches her eat the fruit before eating it himself. He's passed. He's passed. It didn't hit him. It's awesome. If you were here last week, we had the we had the AC like cut off right at like a huge like climax kind of thing. It was cool. <laughs> I didn't plan it. I know you might be thinking it. I didn't. I'm not that smart. So going into marriage, as we talk about marriage, that's what we're facing. Those statistics that I just mentioned, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a lot of people who do not take the call to marriage and the call to fatherhood very seriously. And yes, I know I could talk about like women. I, I promise I'm not here to just dog on men. I promise. Everybody has issues. There's no debate about that. But anyway, the reason that I bring up men is because of what Ephesians chapter 5 says. But before we fully unfold that, there's a couple of things that I want to bring up from this passage of Song of Songs that I think can help start a marriage off at least on the right foot. Now, in the Mingling of Souls, Matt Chandler argues that uh, these mighty men, these 60 men that are surrounding Solomon's uh, little carriage, it mentions bed. It's not a bed. It's not the way that we would think. How many of you have ever seen the Robin Hood movie, the Disney one, where everybody's like an animal? Has anybody seen that? No? Just me? Cool. Okay. There's a handful. Man, I feel really weird today. Everybody's like, I'm clearly the strangest person who's ever lived in the town of Bell. <laughs> Apparently. Anyway, okay, so now that that, now that that movie is kind of irrelevant and like three of you have seen it, 
If you have seen it, there's a scene where the, the prince, John, he's kind of the bad guy. He's sitting on this carriage in his cup. It's like carried by rhinos, and they're just like running with or maybe hippos or something. Uh, and so like that's what they're carrying, and that's kind of what this bed is. It's like this carriage that would have been carried. That's most likely what it is. But the men who surround it, it's 60 of like Solomon's mightiest men. They're armed with swords. They're trained with swords. These are like people of war. Now, Matt Chandler, he argues that these are the groomsmen that are present at the wedding. That's most likely not the case. I would, I would not say it. Maybe he, I don't know if he meant that literally, but as I read it, these probably aren't actual groomsmen. That's probably more of a recent modern thing of having actual groomsmen stand at your side. But I do want to bring up a point where it should be similar. I do want to bring up a point of similarity between these two things. You see, what we see in Song of Songs is 60 men who show up to this wedding, and they are ready to fight to the death in order for it to unfold. They are ready to protect this couple from anything that might try to harm them. Now, I do want to transition to the idea of having groomsmen and bridesmaids. So I want to make this quick little parallel. The people that you choose to have stand next to you, they should be there to fight for your marriage. They should be there to stand by your side, not just at the point that you guys got married, boom, mission accomplished, these should be people who are going to walk alongside you throughout your marriage, and they're going to help push you towards having a biblical marriage. These should not be the people that you're going to call and gossip about your spouse to and have them say all kinds of horrible things and say, you know, that person's not worth you know, being with. Maybe, maybe you just picked the wrong person. That's not the way this should be. These people who choose to stand at your side and who you ask to stand by your side, they should be, be people who are going to be by your side the whole time. And I would hope that we pick people as Christians who will push, or push us towards godliness in our marriage. That would be my hope. Now, we can kind of move into Ephesians chapter 5. I'm sure you guys are like super ecstatic and you've just been on the edge of your seat waiting to see what I'm going to say about it. That was a little bit of sarcasm. Good. I'm, so, I'm glad some of you guys are. That's awesome. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33, it says this. And we're going to go ahead and kind of go straight on through. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present... The church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined in his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. There's a lot to unpack here. And for the record, because of this passage... A lot of people, they've looked at the Song of Songs, and they've said that the, the Song of Songs is meant to be about Jesus and his love for his church. I don't believe that. 
But if you want to, especially moving forward as we get into like the honeymoon stage and everything that unfolds after weddings typically take place, if you want to pretend that it's about Jesus, that's totally cool. That's up to you. I'll let you interpret that how you want. But because of this love between Christ and his church, a lot of people, they draw parallels to the Song of Songs because it has a wedding and it has kind of this love between a man and a wife. And so they say, well, it's, it's about the, you know, Christ's love for the church. I would disagree. I think it's pretty literal and it's a poem. But not so much in the fact that Jesus hadn't come yet, nor had the church. So besides those points, we're not going to deal too much with it. Here are some points that I want to put out there. Everybody's favorite verse, 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Everybody loves that one. And by everybody, I mean guys. Uh, guys love that one. That's about it, really. Let's just be real. Um, yes, that is what the Bible says. Wives are to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. And the reasoning is because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of his church. Now, that's pretty much all the instruction given to wives. That is pretty much all of the instruction given to wives is that they submit to their husbands as to the Lord. There's a ton of stuff in here about how husbands should be. There's a ton of stuff. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Okay, cool. You know, that sounds easy enough. And how he gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. Okay, cool. In the same way, husbands love their wives as their own bodies. Why? Because he who loves his wife loves himself. And because Christ loved his church, because that is his body. There is a lot to unpack about how a husband should love his wife. And there's not a whole lot that's specifically said about how husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loves the church. But I want you to think about everything that you might know about the Gospels. Right? So everything that you might know about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four books that all demonstrate how Jesus loved people. That is the entire point of those four books. We have Jesus healing people. We have Jesus feeding people. We have Jesus dying for people who hated him. Yeah. How do you love your wife? If you are a husband and you're reading this passage and you're saying, do I love my wife as Christ loves his church? I'm going to throw it out there that in the year of 2023 and the United States of America, probably not. Yeah. Probably not. If we're just being completely honest. And a lot of it has to do with the way that many of us guys, we were raised. If you were raised more traditional, you've kind of always been used to this whole, like, wife serves the husband, and husband just kind of, like, brings home the money. I know that's kind of like what you see for most of American history. But I want you to really think about it. I want you to really think about that. How would Jesus... We're, not, we're no longer talking about Jesus in church. I want you to imagine that Jesus is a man just like you. He comes home from a long day of work. How does he respond to his wife when he walks through the door? I want you to think about that. The whole, you know, cliche, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do when he walks through the door? Is it... Hey, what's for dinner and is it made yet? Does that sound like something that Jesus would say when he walks through the door? Would he maybe go to his wife and embrace her, love her, and say, Hey, what did you have planned for dinner? How can I help? Yeah. Which one sounds more like Jesus? 
if you had to be honest with yourself. The second one. That sounds more like Jesus. Now, let's go back to some of the stories that I read on TikTok. Imagine Jesus, his wife is giving birth, and I, I'm not trying to be a heretic here, I don't believe that Jesus had a child, we're just, this is just hypothetical. So, Jesus is in the room as his wife is in labor. Does Jesus sit there and complain about the comfort level that he's in? Or does he ask his wife if there's anything he can do to make her more comfortable? Is there anything he can do to ease the pain that she might be? Which one sounds more like Jesus? Because as Christian men who are married, which I'm not married, okay, I get that. I know it's easier said than done. Nobody's perfect, okay? I get that. But at every turn, we ought to be asking ourselves, how would Jesus respond to his wife if he was in my shoes when I feel inconvenienced? How would Jesus respond in this situation? And if it sounds like Jesus would not love his wife in that way, we should probably reconsider the way that we're about to handle it. Jesus, this is real life, we're, we're, back, we're not talking about hypotheticals now. Jesus laid down his life for his church. Jesus was not about how he could be served, but about how he could serve others. How he could serve his people, his church, his bride. It wasn't about how his bride can serve him. If Jesus was waiting on people like you and me to serve him, he'd be waiting a long time. But that's not what he did. He was willing to serve us. And get this, he was willing to serve us when we weren't worth serving. When you and I were not worth being served, he chose to serve us. Okay, now that I've dogged on men, wives, <laughs> submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But I want to bring up that point in a different way. There's this big issue with this idea of submission. Right? I want you to think of submission as kind of following. I want you to think of submission as following. Following the lead of your husband. Here's the thing. That is really hard to do at many points, as I'm sure many of you women are aware. It is not easy to follow, especially when you know that it's probably not the right way to go. But here's what I want to argue. As you are a wife of your husband, believe it or not, your husband is a wife of Christ. And I know that's a weird thing to think about. It sounds kind of strange and foreign. But if your husband is a Christian man, he is part of the bride of Christ. And so just as you are expected to submit to him as your husband, he is expected to submit to Christ and what Jesus' will is for his life. Trust me, that's a man worth following. Yeah. And I think the issue is, is that a lot of women, they have a hard time following the lead of men because a lot of men aren't worthy of leading. Think about all the statistics I just read. There are all of these children who are growing up without fathers, or they're growing up with abusive fathers, or alcoholic fathers, and a lot of these men, they mistreat their children. The other day I saw another TikTok, okay, it sounds like I spend way too much time on TikTok. I do, but that's not the point here, okay? This is not about me, this is about us, so not the point. 
But I came across this video, and as many of you know, I enjoy MMA, and I like the UFC, and I, I like the whole fighting thing, and it's, it's kind of cool to watch. You know, like, sometimes as a guy, you just need to watch somebody get their face bashed in. This is true. And sometimes it helps you not do it to somebody else. Let's just put that out there. Most of those guys come from broken households. They got lucky. Because when they chose to fight people out of their own anger that they had, because of the way that they had been treated by their father, or maybe the way that they had been walked out by their father, they got to make a huge living out of it. Most of the time, they ended up in prison. But I'll, I'll never forget, I was watching one of the, okay, I can't say never, but recently I saw a video, and it's the guy who just earned this, this title, I think it's like the heavyweight title, uh, for the UFC, and naturally when that happens, these people, they end up in all these different interviews that unfold, and on this particular interview, he got to talk about his dad. He got to talk about his dad and how his dad was an alcoholic who beat him, and because of all of the, the beatings that he got from his dad, he was able to take it when he steps into the ring. I want you to ask yourself, is that the destiny that you want for your son? Is that the destiny that you want for your children, to feel like the only way for them to make it through the world is to fight because of the anger that they have? Be there for your kids. Be there for your kids. Because as marriages tend to unfold most, most times, you end up with children. They are an extension of you, both man and wife, right? So both husband and wife, they are an extension of you. It's so, so, so important to not only love each other as Christ would love each other, but to love your kids as Christ loves your kids. Because a lot of these things that unfold with children, whether it's juvenile delinquency, or whether it's you know homelessness and some of the other things that we looked at, a lot of it happens because there's not much love felt in the home. That is a dangerous place for your children to be. So husbands, love your wives as Christ would love you. And think about all the things that he did for you. Wives, be willing to follow the lead of your husband. And I get it. I get it. It's hard. It's hard. Because not all husbands are following the lead of Christ. I understand that it's hard. That's why it's so important to bring the message of the gospel into their lives. I, it's blanking on my, on my mind, but uh, elsewhere as Paul talks about marriage and stuff like that, uh, he talks about people who are married to non-believers. And essentially he says, if you're a believer and you're with a non-believer, don't leave them. Because you could be the only version of the gospel that they get. You could be the only version of the gospel that they get. So wives, submit to your husbands, follow their lead, but men... Make sure that you're someone worth following. Love your children. If you've been with us throughout this, this series, you know that I've not really had any one big one-liners for you to write down. I've just kind of been throwing out some of these nuggets of wisdom from the Song of Songs and allowing you to take what you need. Because as I mentioned uh, I believe I mentioned it last week. I know I mentioned it the first week. All of us here, we're in different stages that we find in the Song of Songs. Some of us, we're just in this dating phase of this initial attraction and getting to know somebody. Some of us, we are maybe in a more long-term relationship and seeing how it leads as far as marriage goes. Some of us, we've been 
we are married and we've already hit that point, the truth is that there's so much teaching for all of us, regardless of what stage we're in. Because if you've not hit that marriage stage, you can at least look to this in the future and say, this is how I want to live my life as that approaches. And for those of you who might have been already down the road a ways as far as marriage goes, you can pass this on to the people that you know who might not be there yet. And now that we've entered into the, into the marital phase, um, a lot of this teaching will be regardless of what stage of marriage you're at, no matter how long you've been married. There's going to be nuggets to take away. So that's just a little preview. Uh, as per usual, this is the time of invitation. Uh, we're going to have the band come up and lead us in one final song. If there's anything that you would like to uh, lift up to the Lord, any prayer requests, uh, any praises that you would like to lift up, this will be the time to do so. Uh, and if you have any decisions that you would like to make, this will also be that time.